In this video, I'd like to talk to you about the design in the human body. And in my opinion, it's intelligent design. And from a Christian standpoint, I don't want to go off on too big of a the, uh, theological tangent, but how can you reconcile, because I'm going to come from, um, come from this from an evolutionary standpoint, which I believe God created through evolution, and I think it is even more majestic than creating each specific kind individually. And I'll kind of allude to that as we go. But in the ancient Hebrew language, which is what Genesis is written in, you have the seven days of creation, and if you translated the Bible a couple hundred years ago, like most of the translations were, you would uh, most likely say 24-hour period for yom, which is their word for both 24-hour period and long but finite time period, which could be millions of years. So basically, the, the original scripture has it right, but how are we as human translators translating that, the exegesis of it? So a couple hundred years ago with what we knew about science, it would probably make sense just to throw a 24-hour period in there. But what if we translated today, it would make more sense to use the other literal meaning. Because this, this Hebrew language is an ancient language. For every Hebrew word they had, we have 10,000 English words to describe things. So they have words that mean several different meanings a lot of times. So that just kind of shows you where I'm coming from, from a Christian standpoint on how this can go along with the Bible. Once you put millions of years, once you substitute that in there, uh, the contention around evolution kind of dissipates or disappears completely. So uh, that's where I'm coming from on this. Um, and starting where we see design beautifully is in the very first cell ever. So from an evolutionary theory, we all go back to one single cell. And that one single cell, to be able to carry out its functions as well as uh, replicate, it has to have a minimum of what scientists think is 473 genes. If you remember, genes reside in our nucleus and it is the instruction set for our proteins. So we'll make a copy in our nucleus the messenger RNA is the copy. It goes out the nuclear pore to the ribosome, and the ribosome will put the amino acids in the right order based on the information given uh, originally from the gene. So each gene, on average, has a thousand nucleotides. Those are the A's, C's, T's, and G's. That's the information. So if we multiply 1,000 nucleotides times 473, which is the, the just stripped down version of the cell, the limit, the, the least amount of genes for it to survive, you end up with 473,000 nucleotides that have to be in a precise order. All the A's, T's, C's, and G's have to be in the correct order, and there's four different combinations for each of the thousand spots, and Physicists have put this together and it comes out to it randomly occurring a probability of 1 times 10 to the 40th power. That's an astronomical number. You, met, you multiply that number times 473, which is the number of genes that were minimum for a cell to be alive, and you're looking at the just so many zeros that you can't even count them. And the, so which that means is there's just no matter if the universe is 13.7 billion years old, there's just not enough time and not enough combinations to make that happen. It's very improbable. And what we know through uniformitarian logic is that anytime we see information, whether it's the digital code of the computer or a, a book, there's intelligence that has to put that information in order. And everything we know is that way. And that's how DNA is. So where's the intelligence to put that original information in order? I say it's God. Some other people may think differently, but uh, I think it's a strong, uh, a strong argument for in intelligent design behind the human body. Also, if you think about it from a chicken and egg perspective, if you have to have enzymes to make proteins, um, 
you know, where did they they come from in the, the, the first place? So you have to have DNA polymerase and all these different enzymes. I don't want to get too far into that, but that's another an, another aspect that makes the 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 origin of life such a such a issue without having intelligence behind it. So looking at the skull, the skull has foramina, which is the plural form of foramen. We have these holes in the skull, and they're perfectly cut out for different blood vessels going to and from the brain, uh, cranial nerves that are coming to and from the brain. For example, we have the carotid artery that a lot of times, you know, you put your fingers on your neck to, to feel your pulse, and uh, that goes up through its own little canal that's cut out just beautifully for it. Uh, we have that big foramen magnum at the back that's cut out just right for our medulla. So we have, you know, our brain stem, we have three different parts, and the lowest part's called the medulla, but, and it leads to the spinal cord. And it has its meninges around it. Also through that frame and magnum, we have the vertebral arteries coming up to serve, bring oxygen and nutrients to the, the posterior, posterior side of the brain. So, uh, you know, this happens during embryologic development, and the fact that these vessels and conduits work so nicely with um, having this bone formed, you know, perfectly around it and everything. Just, it, I just marvel at the complexity of it. And just to think that this all started from a single cell and that God put enough information and uh, plasticity in that first cell to allow all the complexity we have today is just so majestic to me. And it's like if you're playing pool with somebody and they went first and they hit each one in individually, that'd be like, making different kinds, like the cat kind, the dog kind. But if they hit that cue ball and hit all of them in with one try, that's like uh, getting that first cell with all the information it needs and the ability to uh, naturally select its way through to get to the uh, complexity we have today. Here we have a neuron and its axon. This is, this is great engineering. If you're an electrical engineer, you know that having insulation around the conduit is going to help get the impulse from A to B faster. And in this case, we have these lipid-based structures called myelin sheath that um, encapsulate and insulate the, the axon. We have long uh, axons. You know, we have the cell body, which is represented over at the left of the screen, in the spinal cord, and it has to. We have axons like our that go in our sciatic nerve that go all the way down to our foot. So we want this impulse to go fast. We don't want to step on attack and have to wait five seconds before we realize it and be able to move it. Uh, so these these uh, impulses they zip along and then they hit one of these nodes of Ranvier. The nodes of Ranvier are named after a French pathologist, Dr. Ranvier, and at these points. You had the saltatory conduction where it zips, hesitates for a second, zips. When I first looked at this, I said, oh my gosh, this is disc teleology. This is bad design. Why don't we have just one uh, uniform myelin sheath all the way down? Why do we have to hesitate? But what would happen if we had that, when I delve into the, the journals that discuss this, is that the, the impulse would dissipate. It may dissipate and completely leave, or it would slow down to the point where... Um, it would be too slow for us to, to function correctly. So what happens at each one of these nodes is it's just open enough and it's spread out just to the perfect point where we can get a recharge. So we get sodium ions influx in through the uh, neuronal membrane, get into that axon, recharge it and give it a boost so we get this fast impulse. And uh, it's just uh, beautiful engineering, beautiful design. Here we're at the trachea and esophagus. So we're at the neck level. On the right side of the screen, we have the histology where we're looking down on it. You can see the backward C of that, of that hyaline cartilage that stains a, a pretty purple color. And so that cartilage, what it does is it prevents the trachea from collapsing on itself. We have those wet mucosal uh, epithelia that, that line that, that tract. And if they touch, if the sides of those touch, they'll stick because they're wet and they'll collapse and that's game over because we won't be able to get oxygen into our lungs. So it's important that we have these cartilage rings to keep that lumen patent and open. But 
we also have a esophagus right behind it. What if we chew our food and when it goes into our esophagus, we call the food bolus. And as that bolus moves down, it would get stuck if we had a complete cartilage. But the, the perfect engineering of this, it's cut out just at the right spot. And this isn't just one cartilage ring. If you look over on the left, you have the, the larger cartilages, your thyroid cartilage, which is your Adam's apple, and right below that, your cricoid cartilage. But then you have maybe 15 or 20 little cartilage rings. And just the, the fact that it's designed where each one of these rings are specifically cut out at the same spot all the way down, just enough to allow the trachea to always stay open and allow the bolus to never be impeded down to the stomach when it when it's being when you're swallowing uh, is just a, the perfect engineering for that. The last thing I want to look at, and this is a term coined by Michael Behe. He has a PhD in biochemistry and he's a professor at Penn University. He coined a term in his book in 1996 called Darwin's Black Box called irreducible complexity. And to understand irreducible complexity, uh, his little icon is the mouse mousetrap. And you can see that it has different parts to it. If you eliminate any of those five parts to the mousetrap, it doesn't function at all. So it has no, you know, it's worthless. The same thing is with a lot of biological systems in the body. He's a biochemist, so he's looking a little bit smaller than like the last slide we looked at, which was more at the gross anatomy level. But what he said in his book was you have these 13 different proteins that have to work together to clot your blood. And blood clotting is really important. I mean, your body, to keep homeostasis, you know, if you clot too much, you could have a heart attack, a stroke, a deep vein thrombosis that leads to pulmonary embolism. So clotting too much is, is bad. But if you don't clot when, say, you have a, a peptic ulcer and your stomach is bleeding, and your body has to, to, to uh, patch that up or you cut yourself. And if you don't have these all, all 13 of these proteins, all of them, you bleed to death. So you could have an internal hemorrhage that leads to bleeding to death or you could have something you know external cut on your body, same thing. And there's a disease for this when you're missing one of these proteins, it's called hemophilia. And so they're missing either protein eight or protein nine but if they don't get injections of that protein, then if they have an internal bleed or something, which is likely to happen at some point, they're gonna die. So um, basically all 12 of these proteins would have had to co-evolve together and happen to just present themselves at the exact same time. You know, I can see a mutation of one protein uh, becoming favorable at some extent and maybe working for something, but all 13 of these have to work together. A blind process, this is improbable, very improbable, but if you think about um, an intelligence behind it, um, you know, the improbability can happen. So all 12 of these proteins had to co-evolve and present themselves at the exact same time, and that's irreducible complexity because if you take any of those proteins out, the whole system fails. And in his book, he goes on and on and on with all kinds of different systems that work this way and uh, one that I can mention too is you know say that you feel something hot at your finger level you have to have that sensory neuron go to your brain and then you have to interpret it through another neuron and then you have to send an effector neuron out to actually mo remove your hand so any one of those three aspects are missing then the whole system fails and you just continue to burn so uh, there's a lot of situations um, that, that could fall short due to irreducible complexity without an intelligence behind it. And uh, if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments section or just uh, shoot me an email and we'll discuss it. Uh, I enjoy this stuff, so um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thanks.